People often describe artificial intelligence as a game changer, but it's something much more than that. It is totally disruptive. It's changing the playing field. So what is AI? All of these definitions are correct, but probably A and B are the closest for our purposes, pattern recognition agents that aid us in problem solving. The first conference on AI and medicine took place almost 40 years ago on the Rutgers University campus, 1975. And Ted Shortliff did the first MD-PhD program at Stanford in 76, when he built the Mycin system for diagnosing bacteremias. Ted has been a hero in AI and medicine for almost 40 years. He helped to found the society of record in this the American Medical Informatics Association. Medicine has been resisting, the, the practice of medicine has been resisting AI for a bit, and it's now becoming accepted. It's coming in through the back door of the electronic medical record system. All of you have heard about Watson. Watson has gone beyond jeopardy. It's now developing the ability to diagnose diseases. Watson has gone to medical school and has become a physician's assistant in oncology. And today's physicians in their medical school classes grew up with AI and computers. They're digerati and they're completely comfortable with the symbiosis of humans and machines. You're familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. I think it's important to understand where AI is on that hype cycle. We started out in disappointment for the first 30 years or so. We're now moving into disruptive stress and amazement. We're about right there on the cycle. And AI, in fact, is here today. Not with the broad, deep, and subtle intelligence that we associate with human intelligence, but with the ability to deliver billions of dollars worth of value and real aid to clinicians in the field in medicine. It's been sponsored by governments all over the world and by the Fortune 1000, and not by accident. I did a study of over 350 well-documented applications of AI at the Conference of Record, the AAAI conference, and these are the features that the applications had in common. And it's not just better, faster, cheaper. It's different. AI allows us to do things that humans just couldn't do before. Like consider your entire genomic profile before making a recommendation and keeping up with the medical literature. AIs have been instrumental in music, transportation, medicine, law, security, manufacturing, oceanography, microbiology, government, ecology, space, and even art. And it's something more than just a lever. It's a fulcrum that increases the power of other exponential technologies like synthetic biology and MOOCs or education, which are just beginning to integrate AI, and robotics on the ground, and robotics in the air in the form of drones that can deliver medicines. It's really moving ahead very rapidly. AIs can augment our intelligence effectively. And the reason why we want to be able to do that is that we want to be able to move forward with nanotechnology, a technology that allows us to build things at less than 100 nanometers and build things to scale with atomic precision. Let's talk about augmentation. Many of you are familiar with this device, this is Charles Babbage's analytical engine. And Babbage could not build this engine in the period of 1837 to 1839, 
when he designed it because the gears of his time were not precise enough. But in fact, Babbage could have built a digital computer using this device, a telegraph relay switch. If he had worked with a truly interdisciplinary team, that would have happened. All of us have a common problem. We're surfing in front of a tsunami wave of 10 to the 21st bytes of information, zeta bytes of information, and our brains didn't evolve under that kind of selection pressure. In fact, the human brain hasn't had a major upgrade in over 50,000 years. And if your smartphone or your laptop hadn't had an upgrade in five years, you'd be concerned about that. So all of us appreciate the augmentation that our smartphones give us. You may know that Siri uh, comes from that tradition. And in fact, this is Doug Engelbart, uh, who was the inventor of the mouse. And Doug had his whole career after inventing the mouse about augmenting human cognition. Really an amazing man. And 40 years later, here we are at Stanford working on what? Augmenting group decision-making and human cognition. We can also do that with some glasses that were designed originally for search, Google Glass. Yes, they're a little geeky, but they in fact do allow us to manage ourselves and perhaps our health. The largest AI project in history was the Kalo project, sponsored by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It was so successful at building an assistant to a commander in the field that SRI Corporation spun out a company, a private company, and it was snapped up by this company, Apple, less than a year after they launched. And Siri makes a lot of dumb mistakes. There are whole websites devoted to the dumb mistakes that Siri makes. But what you see in Siri today is just the tip of the iceberg of assistant technology that we'll all have in our pockets as we roam around the world. Google's answer to Siri is Google Now that can be used in conjunction with Google Glass. And here is an interesting group of people. The guy on the left is Adam Chire. He was the architect for the Kalo project, the architect for Siri. He left Apple and now he's out to do Siri right. He just came out of stealth mode after two years. He's got a $10 million funded startup called Viv Labs. And Adam is very persistent. He wants to build truly effective assistant technology. Let's talk about some development vectors. The great science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But we want to look under the hat. So what would we find? Task and domain-specific knowledge engineering, statistical and deep machine learning, biologically inspired computing architectures. This is an axial or top-down view of a female human brain. And you can see the association tracks within the hemispheres and across the hemispheres, across the corpus callosum. Why is that important? Because AI scientists are now emulating this kind of late-binding association structure in software. You may recognize the guy in the, on the, uh, your left of the screen, Jeff Hawkins, who was the inventor of the Palm Pilot. Some of you are old enough to remember that first smartphone. And uh, Jeff has been studying neuroscience for the last decade or two and has developed a system called Grok that takes data sources from the real world, auto-encodes them, and does prediction and anomaly detection. Here's a guy also sponsored by DARPA, Darmendra Moda. He's heading up the DARPA Synapse Project at IBM Almaden. They have simulated 100 trillion synapses and 530 billion neurons of a macaque monkey brain. And they've simulated 383 different brain regions. And they didn't just stop with software, they reduced to practice in hardware. Take a closer look here. 
This is a package that's two millimeters by three millimeters, 256 neurons by 1,024 axons. If you do the math, that's 262,000 programmable synapses on a single low-power chip. And Darmendra and team didn't stop there. They not only developed that neurosynaptic core, but also an architecture to connect them called the True North Architecture, a new programming language for parallel programming called the Correlate Programming Model, 100 algorithms with applications, and con new conceptual models of cognitive systems. This is a real tour de force in four recent papers. And that was ancient history. Here we are in 2014, and that little chip has gone from 256 programmable neurons to a million. 260,000 programmable synapses to 256 million, and one neurosynaptic core per chip to over 4,000. That is exponential change. Wired Magazine had a front cover saying, artificial intelligence is here, but it's nothing like what we expected. Well, I'm not sure what they expected, but clearly it's not your grandmother's AI. We now have very, very fast machines, very powerful machines, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, suggested that we should annotate individual data items on web pages, URIs, Uniform Resource Identifiers, instead of URLs for web pages. But it turns out that most of the data on the web are dark and messy and not really so well organized. This turns out to be a very labor-intensive task. And that's what led Peter Norvig and his colleagues at Google to talk about the unreasonable effectiveness of data. If you have access to billions of bits of data, you can make amazingly sharp inferences from it. Jeremy Howard talked to you about the effectiveness of the deep learning algorithm, the champion machine learning algorithm today. And in fact, you can download the R programming package and R Studio onto your laptops and do a very credible job of using the deep learning algorithm, and I recommend that to you. There's a conference called the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference that's all about simulating evolution. Let me just give you a brief view into this. Uh, the idea here was to uh, simulate creatures uh, in a simulated world, and they're sort of selected for their ability to move quickly. And we have uh, four different materials, two kinds of muscle, tissue, and bone. And uh, the one rule uh, in this selection process is faster creatures have more offspring. And here's what evolved. We don't need sound for this. Thank you. So you can see that these creatures look a little clunky, like Lego toys or something. But uh, the, the robo-dogs that were in the inter international robot soccer competition started out looking like drunk soccer players, and now they play with elegance and beauty. So maybe we'll see these things dancing across the, the screen in a couple of years of exponential time. So we have the Megal system on the web to navigate people from a state of ill health to a state of health. They call that clinical GPS. We have the Archimedes system that was just purchased by Avera uh, that is simulating human physiology. We have practice fusion which is a free electronic medical record system that has a huge user base and is now bringing in clinical decision support fueled by AI. We have the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize that Peter probably talked to you about, or maybe Daniel, that is all about getting AIs to diagnose diseases up to the level of board-certified physicians in 15 different diagnostic areas on a smartphone, and probably outside the US where there's less guild protection. Let's talk quickly about artificial general intelligence. We're going to use lots of different sensor systems to characterize the brain. I believe eventually we'll understand the brain like we understand the heart or the kidneys. Yes, we don't understand it that way today, but eventually we will. We'll use lots of different sensor systems, and we'll fuse the data from them. Like fMRI, we put people in a high Gauss magnetic field and see where the blood flows when they do specific cognitive tasks. A very primitive way to understand how our brain works. But we'll keep at it, we'll build lots of models of the brain, and eventually we'll develop artificial neocortex. And that artificial neocortex will not be limited 
by the size of the human skull. And why is, it, why is that an important thing? If you unwrap the neocortex, it's about the size of a dinner napkin. And one could imagine building artificial neocortex with the surface area of this room, or San Diego, or California, or the US, or the planet. And you might think, whoa, that's a little excessive. It's not excessive because of this. This is the accelerating wave of human knowledge from the public library of science, science citations in many different fields. You might be able to master, if you're particularly brilliant, four or five or maybe six disciplines in science and technology, but not the whole thing moving at exponential speed. And that's a perfect job for an AI and a human working together. Let's think about the implications. What if we succeeded in creating superintelligence? Well, we certainly would solve some very hard problems that are difficult for us today, including perhaps aging. But I would caution us that these systems will not think like we do. We may suffer some unintended consequences, maybe even intended consequences. But I believe that we're morally responsible for our inventions. You may not understand your children perfectly, but you're still morally responsible for them until they earn your trust. And these systems will be similar. We'll have to monitor their behavior. There's no absolute safeguards. We'll need diverse layered controls. And it's worth being proactive now. Assuming zero technology breakthroughs, professional work is ripe for disruption. I like to say that all jobs can be automated, except ours, of course. So you know about the Fry and Osborne study from the Martin School on the future of employment. They indicated that there was a high probability of 47% of US jobs being automated over the next couple of decades, not immediately. So that's something for us to think about, even in healthcare, if you're interested. Look at Bryn Jolson's and, and Andrew McAfee's books, Race Against the Machine or The Second Machine Age. We're headed for change, and not just the more things change, the more they stay the same kind of change, but radical disruptive change. Disrupt or be disrupted is the new motto. Here's Gary Kasparov, who wrote a book on how life imitates chess. This is the guy who lost to IBM's Deep Blue in 1997. And his observation is that when you combine strong processes and AIs and people, you get a better, stronger result than AIs alone. So racing with the machines is the way to go. What we're after is insight, not just number crunching. People often ask, how do you think outside the box? Our answer, there is no box. We're all living inside of alternative mental prisons. You can pick the one you want, whether it's colorful or honeycombed. It doesn't matter. What matters is breaking out of the box. You may be concerned about the long-term implications of these systems. What we need to do is to build the future boldly and do it proactively. So that's what leads us to say at Singularity University that sustainable human intelligence requires mathematical, ecological, and ethical literacy. We don't have time for a full exposition of that here, but we're going to do a workshop later. You're welcome to come to that, and we can discuss those issues in detail. We encourage you to build the future boldly, and don't worry about black swans. Plan for unanticipated events in flexible, proactive ways. What we're after is truly to build the future boldly and do it responsibly. Remember, our skies are not the limit. Thank you very much.